A very good evening to all uh, brothers and sisters in the Dhamma. So today is Thursday, yeah? Thursday the 10th of September 2020. We will continue with our Heart Sutta, second edition, page 203. We are at lesson 41, our last chapter. Yeah? Okay, just relax body and mind. Yeah? Then we can proceed with our meditation. We can have half an hour of silent inner awareness meditation. Yeah? So as usual, we will uh, get ready, prepare ourselves for this awareness-based meditation. This meditation is very simple yeah? when you understand. You just have to relax body and mind. Completely relax, make yourself at ease, eh? like you have nothing to worry, nothing to do, eh? nothing to attend to, just relax, yeah? physically relax, like after a tired day, relax, then mind, relax, no need to think about anything, because you are here to meditate, just tell yourself, allow this mind eh? to Settle down to develop the ability to be at peace, to have the inner peace, inner calmness, so that you can just maintain awareness. So relax and maintain awareness is most important. The word relax is very profound, very deep, not easy to understand. Initially, you may think you are relaxed, but after a while, later on as you train, you realize it's not easy to be completely relaxed. Mm -hmm. In fact, there is a lot of stress when you go through life. Uh, the stress can come from many anger. Yeah? Sometimes it could be your own personal problem that lead to stress. Sometimes it's a work-related problem. Sometimes it's relationship related problem. Mm. Sometimes it could be due to certain happening in life, eh? like disease, sickness or illness or misunderstanding between parents, children, and also brothers and sisters and good friends. So all this can bring about stress to the individual. So for stress to start is normally related to worry, fear, anxiety, and finally unhappiness leading to sorrow and lamentation. So meditation is to relax body and mind so that you can de-stress yourself. So that whatever happens, just let it be, let your mind settle down. Hmm. So ability to relax and maintain silent within or awareness within is very important. To be aware means without thought, just the mind aware before the thinking, before the knowing, just aware. Then you can meditate, you can find out what is happening within your own physical body and mind. So now we will off the light, yeah? then you can have your half an hour meditation, awareness-based. So remember, relax, body and mind, don't do anything, and allow whatever thought that arise or thinking that arise, let it arise. Do not resist, do not do anything. Then that ability to relax and maintain silent awareness is the meditative way to understand your mind. When you allow it to be, don't do anything. All your thinking will start to slow down until finally it becomes very quiet. Then you can perceive the shift of consciousness. Like suddenly the mind has become quiet. Yeah. Then you follow that silence in the awareness. Continue to relax into it and maintain the peacefulness within. When you can stabilize that, your mind become 
the meditative mind and is very beautiful. That mind which is in the meditative state is just aware, tranquil, peaceful and still or silent. Yeah. And when you are in that state, you can understand many things, whatever that arise within your form and mind, you can understand. Hmm. Okay, so I will let you meditate on your own. Yeah? Just remember two things. Relax, maintain awareness. Don't try to know. Don't try to do anything. Just let the mind settle down and realize its original state before the thinking. So that is your true mind, your silent mind, the meditative mind that can understand that can develop the meditation, okay? Okay, you can slowly, mindfully come out of meditation. <laughs> Try to maintain whatever inner peace, inner calmness, and inner awareness that you have developed for as long as you can. We are at part three of lesson 41. Eh? Earlier on, we completed part two. Eh? Part two, we covered the seven mental factors of enlightenment, which is Sattā Bhujanga. These are factors within your mind state that are very conducive for enlightenment. Eh? We have seven of them. Eh? Sati, Nama, Vijaya, Virya, Piti, Pasati, then Samadhi and Upeka. These are the seven factors of enlightenment. Yeah. So if you meditate and you didn't develop any of the factors of enlightenment, means something is not right. Yeah. If you have been cultivating correctly, developing the meditation correctly, and appropriately, then this mental practice that leads to enlightenment, we call it the Sattā Bhujanga, seven factors of enlightenment. They keep on arising in us, especially the first factor of enlightenment, Sati. Sati is just mindfulness or awareness before the knowing. We are aware most of the time because we have trained this mind the mind that is trained will listen to you. When you want it to be peaceful, silent and aware, it will just do that. And when you want it to arise, to do things, it will do that. So this is the trained mind. Huh? The trained mind listen to you. So when your mind is trained, you have less problem. You have more peace, more calmness inner peace leading to inner awareness that makes you calm and peaceful. So this inner peace, when developed well, can lead to inner well-being. Then it can develop the ability to meditate. Hmm. Then the second factor of enlightenment is Dhamma investigation. Without sati or mindfulness, you cannot investigate Dhamma. Only after you have sati can you investigate Dhamma. Eh? Then when you investigate Dhamma, this Dhamma stand up to investigation means you know the teaching of the Buddha is the truth. That's why it stand up to investigation means it is in accordance with reality, not just knowledge or theory, uh, or some form of belief system, they will not be able to explain to you the way things are. So only truth can explain to us the way things are. And teachings that has the truth can let us have the understanding of life and awakeness. Mm. So this Dhamma Vichaya or Dhamma Investigation 
is to allow us to investigate into all the teaching <clears throat> to see whether it complies with the nature's law that governs life and existence or not. So when you investigate the Dhamma, Dhamma are the teachings of the Buddha. Whatever the Buddha teach is called the Dhamma. The Dhamma is truth. If it's truth, it will stand up to investigation. It is the truth. Yeah. Then it can explain the way things are. That's the reason why the Buddha said, if you have to take care of karma, then you find out whether it's true or not. If you don't take care of karma, what happened to you? If you are mindful, hateful, and you understand what constitutes evil, then you can train your mind to have the ability to keep the precept. When you keep the precept, you are taking care of karma. Because precept consists of evil, major evils. When you violate them, they become evil. So this understanding is very important. Then we can put it to test. Take for example the first precept. The Buddha said, Panati Pata Viramani Sika Padang Samadhi Yami. Means we undertake the training rules to abstain from killing and causing harm to fellow living beings. So if you do that, what will happen to you? If you start to kill, harm, and cause misery to fellow living being, then it constitutes evil. And who will do that? Only people who are violent, who are selfish, who are deluded, they will do that. They will kill and they will harm. So inability to keep the precept means you have the evil roots. And these evil roots are the root of all evil. When you have them, the greed, hatred, and delusion, you will commit evil. So if you give rise to evil through killing and causing harm to fellow beings, what will happen to you? People will take revenge against you. Or people will report you to the police. Then you get yourself entangled. So whatever evil, when you commit them, there are nature's law that will take care of whatever that the living being do. Even society has its own law. Society also have law to forbid killing and causing harm to fellow living being cheating, deceiving, and all those things. So Dhamma investigation is uh, very helpful. When you understand, you know how to apply them. Then when you apply, then you realize that not to investigation, then the teaching is the truth. Means you need to keep the precepts. If you go against the nature's law, the moral causation, and don't keep the precept, then it will give rise to problem for you when you go through life. And this problem will lead to suffering, misery. So that is what the teaching is all about. If you keep precept, means you have to avoid all evil, do good, and purify the mind, as taught by the Buddha. Okay, we move on to the third spiritual faculty. When the teaching stand out the investigation, we will have this spiritual zeal inside us, the necessity to drive us to go this way, to cultivate the teaching. And that third spiritual faculty is called virya. Hmm. Then when you have this virya, it will actually drive you to cultivate the meditation, which is to train your mind to be aware, mindful, then stabilize it to be ever mindful. So when your mind becomes mindful and very stable, it will lead to a type of calmness, spiritual calmness, spiritual peacefulness. We call it pity. Pity 
it's a type of spiritual joy, spiritual rapture. Yeah. Rapture, sorry. <laughs> rapture, no rapture, rapture. It's a, like a very nice feeling, very calm, very peaceful feeling. So this is the result of meditative training. So spiritual calmness or spiritual joy and spiritual peacefulness is essential for meditation. Then when pity arises, your mind becomes very quiet, very peaceful, full of joy and very quiet. Then you have to continue to relax into it, silent everything. Then it transforms. Then from pity, it transforms to become sukang. Sukang is spiritual blissfulness of mind, but this is not enlightenment factor. So continue to relax into that blissfulness. Then allow the mind to slowly settle down until you become very quiet, very still. We call that positive. Varsity is the tranquility of mind, the stillness of mind, or the silent mind without thought. So your meditation is to develop this varsity, tranquility mind of mind, the stillness of mind. When the mind is just aware without thinking, it is very quiet, very peaceful, and very still. It means your mind is already trained. Mm -hmm. Initially, it can still stir because it's not stable. And also because the latent tendency or anusaya are not rooted out as yet. Mm. So this latent tendency or habitual tendency, they are very strong and very powerful within our mind state. So you need to continuously relax into positive and stabilize it until it becomes samadhi. Samadhi is a sixth enlightenment factor. Samadhi means the mind is not only peaceful, quiet, tranquil. It is collected and unwavering. That is the difference. So the mind that is collected and unwavering can see things as they are. At the moment of sense activity, it will not stir, it will not react to sense experience. It can be at peace, it can see things clearly as they are. Then when you have sati and samadhi, with the ability to see things as they are, wisdom will arise. When wisdom arises, you develop panya. Panya will give rise to the mind that is equanimous. The last enlightenment factor, Upeka, will then arise. So Upeka is the tranquility of mind that has the wisdom to be at peace with all situations. So this Upeka is the equanimity of mind born of wisdom. There is no more delusion. That's why it does not grasp, it does not cling, it does not stir, and it does not react. So the feeling that arises at the moment of sense experience during contact will remain as pure feeling because there is wisdom there. Or the Buddha call it wise attention or yonisop manasikara at the moment of sense experience. Similarly, for perception, sankara in consciousness, etc., they are all non-grasping because of the wisdom. So the five aggregates of form and mind become pure aggregate, non-grasping aggregate. Okay, after that, we went on to second part, 2.2. We covered the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are the essence of the Buddha's teaching. Eh? So if you want to understand more, you go and listen to the recording. Eh? Last Tuesday's recording is very good, very comprehensive. Eh? It explained to us the essence of the Buddha's teaching. And because of the great wisdom of Lord Buddha, he was able to summarize 
all of his understanding into just four noble truths. And these noble truths are very unique truth. They are like the secret of life. When you understand them, like you understand life completely because it summarizes to us all of life, both the mundane and super mundane. Whatever you want to understand about life is in that teaching, the fundamental truth. And this teaching, which is the essence of the Buddha's teaching, are called noble truth because when you understand them, awaken to them, you can become noble ones or enlightened ones. So in the time of the Buddha, 2,000 years ago, noble ones are called enlightened beings. They are enlightened beings are very noble in all aspects of their life. They are very noble in the way they understand life. That's why they have right view, right understanding and wisdom. They understand the nature's law that governs life and existence, the five universal order, pancha niyamas. Then they also conduct themselves in a very noble way. That's why with right understanding or right view, they will arise the right talk all the time, then right speech, right action, and right living, which means they conduct themselves in a very noble way. They are incapable of evil. They will not arise any inappropriate or wrong thought, wrong speech, wrong action. And they don't live the heedless life. They lead the heedful way of living life. So all this is part and parcel of the qualities of enlightened beings. Then they also constantly develop the four I effort to transform themselves, to improve themselves, to purify their mind. The right effort, the first tool is to deal with defilement, wrong thought, wrong speech, wrong action. Then the next two, the third and fourth right effort, is to cultivate the virtue or the wholesome thought that are still not in you wholesome action and wholesome speech that are still not in you. Then the final right effort is to refine upon this right thought, right speech, right action and right development of mind state until your mind becomes very peaceful, very calm and just aware within so that it is incapable of evil. It can only arise all the wholesomeness of action, speech, and thought process. Mm. Then finally, the last two mind states are sati and samadhi. They are constantly in the meditative state. They are heedful in the sense that they are ever mindful, constantly meditative. These are the qualities of enlightened being. That's why they are classified under the teaching as Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, means when you have the embodiment of this Noble Eightfold Path factors, you are Noble Ones. You will have transformed and become enlightened beings. Then when you are enlightened, your mind state are different. There is clarity, there is tranquility, stillness of mind, there is joy, there is happiness, no more suffering. That is the big difference between an enlightened being who has trained their mind, who is heedful and mindful, as against a heedless person who is very heedless in the way they live life, is they don't meditate. They don't train their mind. They do what they like. That's why they are full of delusion, ignorance, leading to all the wrong speech, wrong action, and wrong thought process. So when you arise them constantly, you become habitual. Then you continuously break your precept, commit evil, lead to suffering and misery. Basically, the teaching is very beautiful and very simple. When you understand you transform. 
when you don't understand, it leads to downfall. Hmm. Okay, with that, we move on to part three. Part three is the continuation. Huh? So today we will continue from where we stop, 3.1. So part three is always meditation question. Huh? After the class meditation, and there will be people who ask questions. So 3.1. The question is on pain huh? or painful sensation that arise during meditation. So according to this uh, Kayanamita, he asked this question, he said, Brad Thiel, since the Cameron Highlands retreat, this Cameron Highland retreat is a yearly affair, huh? except this year because of MCO, we have to cancel it. Huh? Otherwise, it has been going on for the last six or seven years. Hmm. So we will have our annual retreat around March every year yeah? held at Cameron Highland, Sampo Temple, yeah? San Bao Si, yeah? near Brinchang. Mm. So according to this Kanemita, he said, since the Cameron Highlands retreat, he was able to feel the different mind states in meditation especially painful feeling and other type of subtle emotion that goes on within her mind. Now I understand that pain is just another negative expression of the feeling that I dislike. So I just relax and let it be without any aversion towards it. The mind is now more at peace and because of that, it effortlessly dropped to the heart. And when this happened, there are more, sorry, there are no more obstacles. And I feel hollow and free, neither feeling the energy nor anything for that matter. I'm able to sit much longer without any feeling of numbness or pain anymore in the leg. Uh, so this is good uh, meditative reporting. Huh? It shows the yogi has developed understanding and progress. Mm. Then I replied to the yogi, this is very good understanding, leading to a very good meditative experience that can stabilize one's insight. Most cultivators make the mistake of reacting to the tactile sensation that arise and label it as pain because of their mind's aversion towards that unpleasant sensation. They do it without knowing that the moment they label it as pain, then a mental hindrance that is dislike for that sensation or what they call ill will has a reason. And ill will is a mental hindrance. This mental hindrance of ill will will hinder the mind from becoming peaceful or entering the meditative state of inner peace, inner calmness. So the lack of peace will condition the meditator to try to note or focus and concentrate the mind to push away the pain so as to become more peaceful. This is introducing thought into the meditation. Hence, you are no more aware, no more heedful, because the doing of meditation is by the thought, which is actively trying to meditate to become peaceful. This is not knowing that you are already peaceful the moment you are silent and aware without thought. To just understand the truth and the reality of what is going on or what is happening within the moment, your form and mind. You will start to understand how the form and mind can condition you into reacting to a certain experience via your own self-delusion or psychiatry to grasp onto the five aggregates of form and mind as the I and the me. This is right insight, 
born of sati, they can see things as they are and understand what is going on there. And then without any thinking or thought, you will develop the wisdom. Eh? So when you want to develop real insight, this is how you do it. Eh? Hmm. Develop sati and silence your mind. Under Vedana Nupasana, the Buddha said, when there is feeling, where there is pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling, you must be aware. This awareness will enable you to understand how your mind via its own wrong view and opinions or self-delusion react to sense experience and label it as pleasant or unpleasant sensation or what we call like and dislike sensation, feeling, leading to the first two mental hindrance of sensual desire and you. This mental hindrance of mind, which are sensual desire and you will, are also part of the evil of greed and hatred. The moment the mind is aware of such delusion, the mind can just relax into the moment without any reaction. Meditation is not just about good, comfortable, peaceful, and beautiful meditation. It's about the development of wisdom to enable the mind to deal with all life situations without having to experience any more mental suffering. So this is a very important understanding. Yeah? So meditation is not just to go after peaceful meditation or good meditation. So this is where a lot of cultivators make the mistake. Yeah? They thought if they can train their mind, develop the meditation to be peaceful, to be calm and just aware within that serenity, then they thought they have progressed. That is good meditation. Yeah. Actually, all this beautiful state of meditation, they will arise if you do it correctly. These are byproduct of meditation, proper meditation training. If you have trained your mind well, the peaceful mind will arise. Because when you are just in city or aware, there is no thought. No thought means no thinking. No thinking means no fear, no worry, no anxiety, no sorrow, no lamentation. Then you are just relaxed and aware within. So without the wrong thought, your mind states are very beautiful. In fact, the mind before the thought arise is your true mind. The thought, that thing, is your mundane mind, thinking mind, dependent originating mind. So if you meditate using thought, means you are creating more and more thinking. So when you create more and more thinking, you tend to focus, concentrate, note and labor and do all those thought-based meditation. In doing so, your mind cannot return to its original state of inner peace, inner calmness, and inner awareness. So the gist of meditation is to actually realize that true mind before it still react or arise to think. So that true mind is the awareness nature within. You have to realize that. So all of meditation that doesn't bring about that transformation is thought-based meditation. So awareness-based meditation, what you need to do is to just relax, maintain awareness, and let the thinking slow down and subside, and let the true mind surface or arise. Then with that true mind, there is clarity, there is awareness, there is tranquility, there is stillness, there is joy. There is just understanding within. That's the meditative mind. So meditation 
is to develop the wisdom to liberate the mind to understand what is going on so that you can always be with your true mind when you are with your true mind you are always in your meditative state and you are always peaceful and just relax in a way with the tranquility stillness and the joy within yeah. because without thought you are very very peaceful it's only when you think you become miserable unhappy the like and dislike surface because you tend to have wrong thought that grabs and cling and hold and thought is incapable of wisdom incapable of awakening thought is only capable of knowledge not wisdom so meditation is to reverse all this to arise the silent mind without thought and that is the true mind which is the meditative mind and that is the one that can meditate insight into phenomena understand what is going on that is the one that can silently observe how your mundane mind arise <clears throat> how to your wrong view your opinion your conditioning your belief system how it condition your mind to stir to react to what you see what you hear what you smell what you taste what you tactile feel and thing that is meditation so the silent awareness that see all this will enable you to straighten your view to understand clearly why you become afflicted unhappy miserable yeah. how you develop the emotion of anger hatred envy jealousy craving clinging grasping even how you end up having misery sorrow and lamentation all this you can see without the wrong view without the self delusion without your views opinion and conditioning or belief system you will not become what you are you will have beautiful understanding but because of your wrong view it condition wrong thought and make you miserable so you have to see clearly and understand what constitute wrong thought wrong thought are thought that condition your fear your misery your suffering your unhappiness your sorrow and your lamentation so whenever you are not peaceful unhappy when the negativity or mind states are there it means you have wrong thought and what are wrong thought thought that has the evil roots of greed hatred and delusion means thought that has mental intention that are evil they are all wrong thought fear arises because you don't understand that's why wrong thought condition fear then when you don't understand you create worry anxiety leading to sorrow and lamentation so all these are due to lack of faith wrong thought wrong understanding lack of right view then because of wrong thought the evil is so great and hatred will condition you into karmic negativity cause you to break your precept violates the moral law cause your karma karmic nature to fall so it brings about collapse in your karmic nature or downfall means if you want to have the good life you must train your mind develop mindfulness heedfulness to observe and see all this clearly then straighten your view and change the way you live life then your karma will improve and when your karma improve your life will improve that's how the teaching actually can benefit living being the buddha always say there is this law of karma if you take care of karma karma take care of your life then you will have the beautiful life 
So the Buddha, through his realization and enlightenment, came to know this very profound truth, which last Tuesday we have gone through. He said, we are all living beings, not only human beings, born of our karma, heir to our karma, conditioned and supported by our karma, and we are what we are because of our karma. So you look at this sentence, everything that involves our life, they are related to karma. If karma is 100% of our life, then what must we do? We must take care of karma because we are born of our karma. Then we inherited everything that we create through karmic actions. <clears throat> and we are what we are every moment, every instant because of our karma. Then karma conditions us into whatever. We are born of karma, add our karma, conditioned and supported by our karma. So understanding this, we straight away will determine to channel our life towards wholesomeness. We will definitely avoid evil. And to do that, we must take care of karma. To take care of karma is just to avoid evil action. Do good. And purify our mind to evil wisdom. That's how this first right view in regards to this law of karma is very important, very powerful. And because of this right view, the Buddha came out with his teaching. His famous advice to all living beings. Dhammapada verse 183. Sabha papasa akarana kusalisa upasampadan sachitta pariyadapadan itang buddhana sasana. So the Buddha say, you have to avoid all evil, do good, and purify your mind. And why? Because through doing this, you can take care of your karma. That's the reason why all meditation start by following the advice of the Buddha. And according to the teaching, how do we avoid evil? We have to keep our precepts. Why? Because all these precepts, the five precepts, they constitute major evil if you don't keep them. Means you are an evil person. When you violate this precept, you create negativity of karma. You will bring about downfall. It will bring about suffering, misery. So avoiding all evil is most important so that you will not create the condition for evil karma to arise. That's why the Buddha say, law of karma is very simple. It's nature's law of cause and effect, except it has the moral causation, the morality aspect, means the mental intention behind. So through your mental intention, if you create negativity of karma, then you suffer, you become afflicted. So what is negativity of karma? Negativity of karma means when the evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion are there. That's how I say these three evil roots, root of all evil, they constitute evil. They make you evil. So whenever your mind state has these three evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion, it will condition you into evil activity, evil speech, evil action, and evil thought process. So to take care of karma is to avoid all evil. Means you must develop the mindfulness to see clearly whenever this evil roots of greed, hatred, and delusion arise, because these are evil roots that leads to evil action, evil coming activity. Then when we are mindful, we are sensitive, and we understand what constitutes evil, we can keep our precept. That's the reason why the precept has this saying, we undertake the training rule to abstain from killing or causing harm to negative, uh, causing harm to fellow living beings. 
Then the second precept is to we undertake the training rule to abstain from stealing or taking things that doesn't belong to us or deceiving people, cheating people, take advantage of situation. All these are wrong action, wrong speech and wrong thought process. This has evil consequences. If you arise them, it constitutes evil. So precepts are very important. Then similarly, the third, the fourth, and the fifth precept, eh? you can read up on your own. Avoiding all evil is simple when you understand, because you only need to train your mind to develop mindfulness and understand what constitutes evil. Then you can be mindful of it. Then you can keep the precept. Inability to keep precept comes about when you are not mindful, when you lack mindfulness, when you don't understand what constitutes evil. That's why you cannot do anything to it. You cannot deal with the condition that arise to cause you to break precept, to violate the nature's moral law of precepts. So what you need to do is to understand the teaching of the Buddha that teach you how to overcome unwholesome thought, wrong thought, and wrong speech and wrong action that will lead to negativity of karma. So there are five ways which we have gone through. You listen to the recording again. You check the teaching. They are all there. Yeah. And the third and fourth way are the most important. They are the meditative way. Just maintain awareness, silence your mind and be with that emotion. Then you will cease to be. The very flowering of that emotion or that thought is the very ending of that thought or that emotion. Then you realize this anger, hatred, fear or emotion that arise in you, they are not intrinsic within your nature. They are dependent originating condition arising emotion. That's the reason why when you don't do anything, you silence your mind and be aware of it, it ceases. Then how can it cease? It ceases because there is no more condition for it to arise. They arise because of condition, dependent on your wrong view, your wrong thought, your mental thinking or energy. They arise. And when they arise, it becomes like aggravated means when you have wrong thought you react to sense experience then you stir your mind and the more you think you feed it with more wrong thought you become more and more angry more and more agitated more and more unhappy that's why when you have problem you tend to develop anger emotion leading to all the unhappiness sorrow and lamentation and sometimes when you have problem that you cannot resolve, you start to become anxious. Then you develop fear, especially when you project your thought. What happens if I cannot deliver? What happens if my uh, spouse comes to know? What happens if my parents come to know? Or what happens if my boss comes to know? So all these are the conditions for your mind to stir and become fearful. Because you project your thought. You go and worry about problem. You don't have the ability to see the problem clearly. When you can understand the problem and see the problem clearly with a meditative mind state that is peaceful, calm and just aware, then you can do something to it. Because no amount of fear, worry and anxiety can solve your problem. You go and worry about your problem, your problem won't end. You become more miserable. When you have fear, it makes your mind state very negative. That fear energy is very, very detrimental to your health. It can lower your immune system and cause you to develop the negativity of mind state that leads to disease, sickness. That's how a lot of people become very sick 
they develop cancer and all those things. So this teaching is very beautiful. When you meditate, train your mind, it becomes different. It can have this clarity to see things clearly. Then I ask myself, what happened? And when I understand what happened, I can move. I can make a decision. Then I can determine to resolve all this amicably so that nobody get hurt. So that I can follow the Dhamma way. The Dhamma way is to avoid all evil, do good and purify the mind. And the teaching taught us how to do it. We have to act with wisdom, understanding, following noble evil power. We must have right view. According to the Buddha, whatever happened, there are causes and conditions behind. And most of this is due to karma, like he said, because we are all born of our karma, heir to our karma, condition is supported by our karma. And we are what we are because of our karma. So whatever happened, it has to do with our karma in the past. Very likely in the past, we must have done all these things to people, cause suffering and misery to people. Now we become the victim. Condition arise, we become the victim and we have to endure all this. Uh, or in our traditional Malay term, you cannot back. <laughs> yes, you cannot hit back by the karmic friction. So when it arises, you cannot complain. Our human mind's problem is we complain a lot. When something unfavorable happened to our life or certain life situations that are not favorable, then we become unhappy, we become angry, we become afflicted, miserable. Then we start to blame. How can these people do all those things to me? How can they pressure me? How can my own parents do this to me? Or how can my trusted friend lie to me and all those things? But when you did that in the past to other fellow living being, you never have that thought. Now when you are the victim, you start to blame people and think that way. So this is what karma is all about. If you don't have understanding, you cannot accept the reality of what happened because this is nature's law, very powerful. You cannot ask why. Why is God unfair? Why this? Why that? The reality is it happened already. And whatever that happened according to the Buddha, they are related to our karma. Because we are born of it, heir to it, condition and supported by it. And we are what we are because of our karma. So if we understand this is karmic from the past, what must you do? You have to accept it first, isn't it? Then you tell yourself, if it's coming from the past, I got no choice. Well, this is what I did to people. So now I'm the victim. It's fair. So if I accept, I'm at peace. I don't get angry. I don't project my thought. I don't blame. I don't create any negativity of emotion. So with that clarity, understanding, I can accept the situation. I can accept them for what they are. Where this is coming. So when I start to accept, I don't react. I'm at peace. When I'm at peace, I have clarity of mind. I'm calm. I can make better decisions. I can see things clearly. Then I ask myself, what must I do? How can I overcome all this amicably? How can I develop the understanding to free my mind so that I can move on? Then the teaching is very clear. Act with wisdom following noble eightfold path. Means I do what I must do. If I need to apologize or seek repentance, not necessary from certain particular person, no. From whosoever from the distant past. That whether knowingly or unknowingly that your karmic nature has caused any karmic negativity, suffering or misery or disease, you would like to sincerely ask for forgiveness. 
and may this sincere request for forgiveness be accepted by all. If you do this, the nature's law operates by itself. Because asking for forgiveness is the first step towards developing harmony, developing the peaceful solution to a situation. It's just like in our society, if we have misunderstanding, argument, or uh, whatever uh, that happened, either between you and your parents, your brothers and sisters, or your colleague, or your good friend, or your neighbor. But if one day you reflect over it, contemplate over it, and decide to make peace, then you decide to apologize. That is the beginning of a solution. Then when your neighbors see that you have become so sincere, so uh, truthful in your uh, intent to make peace, they will also tone down and they will say, oh, it's okay, it's nothing, it's also our fault. Uh, then that situation become different. That's how you seek a solution. So nature's law is the same when you ask for forgiveness. When you start to seek repentance, the nature's law just operates. Then after that, you act. It doesn't mean you don't act, you still act. You act with wisdom. Then you tell yourself, if that is the case, due to karma, now I can accept, I can be at peace. So I need to apologize, I apologize, finish. Then I will move. How do I move? I have to use my own noble effort of quality. I have to speak in a very nice, pleasant, and gentle way. That's why right thought will condition right speech. Then you will act appropriately, rightly, without deceit, without trying to cheat or be emotional or what. You talk to people nicely. If I have caused you any misunderstanding, huh? or maybe suffering or misery, I would like to sincerely ask for forgiveness. Please forgive me. There is no intent behind. Uh, and do you think there is any way we can resolve this amicably so that we can move on? Otherwise, you suffer. I suffer. Both also suffer. What for? This is not life. Especially misunderstanding between spouse or good friend or parents and children. Resolve it then and then. How do we resolve it? Speak honestly, sincerely. Speak following noble eightfold power. Ask for forgiveness. Then speak in a very gentle and pleasant way. Yeah. Then you can thank them for whatever that happened. When you start to show appreciation of what people have done for you, when you have gratitude towards them, when you respect them, when you have contentment and understanding, your speech becomes gentle, pleasant, and wholesome. And people like you because you are different. You no longer like, like try to hurt people, say something negative until they can feel that you are not sincere at all. You, you are trying to like create more and more misunderstanding and negativity. Then you are not being sincere. You try to take advantage of situation. That's why you develop certain quality which are very good for relationship and communication. Be sincere, be kind, be gentle, be helpful. Then sometimes if you can have the means, be generous a bit. Yeah. That will go a long way. Yeah. And whatever you can appreciate or observe through your own understanding, you actually say a few of these nice words. It doesn't cost you any money, but it brings forth the condition for good relationship to flourish. Uh, thank you so much for helping. Uh, you have been very kind, very thoughtful. Uh, I never knew you would do that. Uh, come, come in, come in. Uh, you are most welcome. So these are all the very nice words. Then sometimes through the phone also, uh, 
How can I help you? Be gentle, be pleasant, be polite. Yeah. Sometimes the other person on the other line may be facing a crisis or emotion. So if you are angry and emotional, the moment you leave out the phone call, your voice is so harsh and so negative. Nobody likes to talk to you on this channel. Uh, that's why pleasantness of character, demeanor, gentleness, then politeness. These are very useful human quality. So develop all the gentle, pleasant, appropriate, right speeches, good speeches that brings about harmony, that brings about understanding, that brings about joy, happiness. Don't go and say negative things that hurt people, like backbiting, lying, <laughs> deceiving. Those are wrong speech. Why can't it? you be a blessing to all? Have goodness, have kindness, have love, have compassion. Develop gratitude, contentment. Hmm. And always thank people for whatever they have done for you, in whatever way, even your children, same. Thank you, girl. Yeah? You are so small, yet you are so uh, understanding. You are not selfish. You are so generous. You are willing to give. I remember when my kids were young, huh? I tested them. Huh? Sometimes they have certain things they like to eat. Huh? I said, can give to the dealer. Huh, both of them, before the cunningness come in, huh? they just give like that. This is human nature. Huh? That's how. But later on, selfishness, uh, hey, I give to you, I don't need to eat. Huh? Uh, then the thought becomes different. That's how. But if you train your kid, especially when they are very young, you can see they are very innocent. Actually, the kid's mind, before they become cunning, is the best. That's why they are very naive. They are very cute. And, and, and innocent. Yeah. That's why when you see the kid, you observe them, you have a lot of joy on because They are very sincere. They are very innocent. They are very cute. Uh, so sometimes they make mistakes, they fall, then they cry. That is the way they are. They are not like human beings, no. very deceiving. Uh, uh, when they don't like you, uh, they pretend that they still friendly to you. But behind the mental intention, and sometimes you can see, you can feel, uh, their expression show. Uh, especially when you meditate, you can sense all these things. Uh, negativity or energy flow, you can sense them. Uh. So, Life is a matter of development of understanding, applying Noble Eightfold Path. So what I share with you, the right speech is very important. Then after that is right action. What are right action? The way you act in your life. Generosity is right action. You can be generous. You can be kind. You can be sincere. These are all very good action. Then you act with understanding. You act with wisdom to bring about like a situation that can help people, help them overcome their suffering, their misery, their problems, to bring about a better condition for humanity, for society, for the world. So whatever kindness and goodness that you can do, these are all right action. Mm, appropriate action. Mm. That's why no stealing, no killing, no cheating, no deceiving. These are all right action. Yeah. Of course, the ennobler of it is better. Instead of not deceiving, cheating, you should be kind and generous. Yeah. So the ennoblers are very good. Instead of not killing or causing harm to fellow living beings, you become a very compassionate person, full of love and kindness. Yeah. So these are the qualities of Noble Eightfold Path cultivation. When you have them, you become beautiful. So apart from meditation, you should develop wisdom, understanding. When you have wisdom and understanding, all this that I explained to you will surface. That's why finally, you will have virtue in you. 
you will have goodness in you, kindness in you. A person who has the Dhamma will have virtue, because without wisdom, there is no real virtue. The good according to you is not the real good. There is the selfish good. But the good according to an enlightened being is real good, because they know all this are not real, not what you think, he know you, he know me. And all this form and mind, they are subject to karma. That's why you will never do all those things. You will never be selfish, because the nature's law is very powerful. When you give or become generous, when you offer something, in our society's term is, I am giving it. But do you know, in the moral aspect, moral causation in the eyes of karma, whatever you give, you give to your karmic nature, it will come back to you. That's the reason why you look at all the wealthy people, especially Bill Gates and Warren Buffett. Why are they so wealthy and so rich? Because in the past, and even this life, when they become wealthy, they are so generous. They donate so much of their wealth towards the well-being of society, humanity, and the world. So the more you give, the more you receive. Because this is the nature's law. If I am kind to you and to others, if I have goodness, generosity, love, compassion, in future, people will be kind to me. They will love me. They will do all the wholesome thing towards me. Well, this is a law of karma. You reap what you sow. If you plant the seed of goodness, you will reap the fruit of goodness. So law of karma is not what you think. So never be selfish. When you are selfish, you try to cheat and deceive. You know what is the law of karma. In future, you become the victim. You will end up being cheated and deceived. At that time, you don't blame. How come these people are that one? Uh, so sweet. This type of thing also can do. Because in the past, you did to people. You are also the cheat, the unethical one. Uh, then when the condition arrives, you become the victim. That's why you will end up going see them, meet up with them. And even the scam and all those things, snatch thief is the same. In previous existence, you have been snatched thief before. This lie you come, you end up many times victim, I tell you. Uh, I have seen many people going through that. Then they say, yo, how come like that? Yeah, during my time, I remember in the 60s and the 70s, when I came down here to study, ladies never get robbed. That time, uh, the robbery, uh, or the they call kukeng uh, in Cantonese, yeah? means they extort your money. Uh. Always the men can now. Uh, during that, early 70s uh, and even uh, late 70s and early 80s. Then lately, uh, I think the year 2000 or uh, you realize that uh, men never can around. Uh, all the snatch teeth are mainly ladies. Uh, they snatch all the handbag, all ladies. Uh, that's why evolution of consciousness. Because in the past, the karmic is such. You look at now, those who are snatched deep, most of them are men in there. Eh? Because these are the people who has the tendency to do this. Then all these people gonna snatch, eh? or most of these ladies that gonna say, in the past, they have been snatched deep before. They are male, understand? But now they take birth in the form of female. That's why the condition will arise that these people with the tendency, they will go and snatch their thing. And society evolve according to consciousness, according to this law of karma. So when you understand this, you become beautiful. Then you will never, never take advantage of anything. It's not worthwhile. Then you will start to see precept in a different way. You look at precept from the point of spiritual understanding, the law of karma. Then you will never violate this precept. We are not worthwhile. Wow, why should I cheat and deceive when I can make a decent living through proper way, with proper understanding? 
where I can have the good life and joy, where I don't create karmic negativity, so that in future I don't have to become the victim and suffer. If I'm always kind, generous, good, caring to people, then I will have good parents, good children, uh, people who are kind to me, generous to me, uh, who are caring towards me. That's why this life I can see my parents, my brothers, my sister, and my friends, everything. They are very beautiful. Maybe people who don't understand, they say, ah, yeah, but you, maybe you are lucky. I can tell you nothing to do with luck. I have seen so many. A lot of people in this society of ours, our world, suffer a lot. The Mandarin saying, jia jia yu it's very true, isn't it? Uh, uh, the other one, my daughter says, you will uh, uh. So, if you understand that, then you will know most people have negativity or karma. That's why they cannot left and right. Everything like upside, upside down. They will be fall. That's why when I share with my children, they also relate to me. They say, daddy, daddy, we are so lucky. How come our family don't have all these problems? One? Well, outside, uh, they saw their classmates, their friends, and other uh, maybe people whom they came across, uh, colleague and other. Hell of a problem. Uh, and the problem never ends. Uh, and this is while they are still young. Uh, they haven't reached old age sickness and death. Uh, uh, they haven't get themselves entangled deep into life yet. Uh. So this teaching the Dhamma is very, very important. When you understand, you really will have a lot of gratitude towards the Buddha, a lot of joy, and you would like to thank the Buddha from the bottom of your heart for giving you such a beautiful teaching to change your life, to transform your life, and to make yourself completely different. When you understand this teaching, you will straight away change your life, and you will end up beautiful. And to change our life is so easy. Follow the advice of the Buddha. Avoid all evil, do good, purify the mind. How to avoid all evil? Train your mind. Understand what constitutes evil. Be mindful. Then keep the present. Without mindfulness, you cannot keep the present. Then when you meditate, develop mindfulness, your mind state have clarity. You don't have those fear, worry, anxiety. Uh, negativity of mind state, uh, emotion and all those things. All this will cease. When you understand the teaching, you are at peace. When you are at peace, you don't stir your mind, you don't project your thought, you don't go and react to problem. You don't go and get angry with problem. Uh, no amount of fear, worry, anxiety can solve your problem. Always remember that. So don't be foolish. Never fear. Never get angry, never get emotional. But these are evil, the root of all evil, make you evil. And when this mind state arrives, you cannot act, you cannot live life, you cannot do anything. So when you train your mind, develop the meditation, you become more efficient, even at your work, your career, everything. Because you have calmness of mind, clarity of mind. You develop inner peace, inner calmness, inner well-being, leading to clarity of mind. Then you are aware. Then you have this understanding, the teaching. Your mind does not stir, does not react. Then you can focus and resolve your problem. Then you ask yourself, what happened? How can I resolve this amicably? How can I move? These are solutions. Instead of going about creating the fear, worry, anxiety, you cannot sleep. What are you doing? You are harming yourself, hurting yourself, and making yourself miserable. This will never bring forth solution. No amount of fear, worry, and anxiety, sorrow, and lamentation can solve your problem, can help you out of the situation. To come out of the situation, you need wisdom, you need understanding, you need the Dhamma. You need to be at peace. Accept the reality first, then move. Follow what I share with you just now. 
Okay, so this is a very important aspect of meditation. Eh? Not only look for peace and calm. Peace and calm will arise as a byproduct. Okay, but when you develop the wisdom, you can free your mind. Then all this beautiful thing can arise. Eh? Okay, now I will continue eh, from where we stop. 3.2. Uh, this is the second part. Eh? 3.2. Okay. Understanding the five ways to overcome uh, unwholesome thought or the five mental hindrance. It has a reason. It's also very important. Uh, this one, just now I asked you to read them. Huh? It's so open. It's inside here. Huh? So I will go through here. The first two ways are still thought-based, huh? but it can help you initially. First, the Buddha say, you must think of the direct opposite wholesome thought. Like when you have anger, hatred, when your mind is very, very agitated, unhappy. So you must think of the direct opposite wholesome thought, which is, Metta or loving kindness. Loving kindness is you wish well being and kindness to all. You can radiate love or metta by reciting, May I, this body and mind of mine, be well and happy. Well and happy. When you have well being and happiness, you cannot be angry. You can also radiate to your loved one, your friends, then later on to your enemy. And all those people whom you have come to have relationship with. So you radiate this metta. This metta is loving kindness. It's a very powerful, soothing vibration or energy. It's the opposite of anger, agitation, uh, stress. When you are angry, there is stress. When you have metta, you have joy, you have peace, you have kindness in you, well-being in you. So think of the direct opposite wholesome thought is very useful. When there is cruelty, when you are very cruel, you want to destroy things, harm things, and all things, develop compassion. Think of the direct opposite, being compassionate. How is it like to be kind, to be compassionate, to serve the sick, to bring about relief from suffering, misery. Now, if you have such problem, it's good to go to Tsuji. You go to Tsuji, they will train you up very well. That organization is very good in compassion in action. When people have suffering, misery through nature's calamity or nature's disaster, like earthquake, tsunami, or even uh, this COVID-19 pandemic and all those things, even flood. So when all this happens, Tsuchi will be the organization that immediately mobilizes and be the very first few to arrive. And most of the time, they are the first to arrive because they are very fast, very organized and very efficient. Then they have a lot of support. So if you join Tsuchi activity, you can do a lot of wholesomeness. They also have recycling. Recycling is to recycle all of the important raw material that we use for our daily needs. So if we can recycle, it will be less harmful to our environment. Otherwise, the pollution will be very severe. Look at the amount of by product that we dump into the earth. The, the negative emission, they call it all the uh, industrial waste, yeah? and even the sewage and all those things. In the past, there was no scientific technology or engineering solution to it. Treatment, sewage treatment. Then now we have Department of Environmental, they suppose to help eh, to protect the environment. That's why the radioactivity waste, 
all the what they call uh, contaminated sludge and even industrial waste. That's why recently our water supply get polluted. It's because of all this discharge. So all this need treatment. If you are civic conscious, you have the kindness in you. You cannot do all these negative things. You will channel them towards recycling uh, or you send them for treatment. Uh, and this will help, uh, help our environment, help society, help mankind. For man and nature is one. If you pollute nature, nature will give rise to the reaction and cause the human race to be affected or afflicted like pandemic, yeah, COVID-19, because the way we live our life, consciousness has become so bad. We have polluted the earth. We have overused our resources. Then the pandemic arise so that you have to lock down, so that you have to stop a lot of economic activity. Then during the first three, four months of lockdown, I remember, people realize uh, the pollution become less. River clean up by itself. Atmosphere clean up by itself. So this is how nature actually can transform, can bring about recovery and all those things. So the way we actually live life is very important. If you don't take care of environment, nature, you and nature are one. If you destroy nature, you destroy yourself. That is as simple as that. So man and nature must harmonize, must come to an understanding, must coexist for our long-term stability, for our long-term life on this planet. So this planet needs a lot of understanding to preserve it, to make it beautiful. This planet can be very useful, very beautiful if mankind, the human consciousness can harmonize with it and develop all the wholesomeness without negativity. In fact, our thinking can pollute the environment. <laughs> Wrong thought, negative thought, harmful thought. These are very evil to the environment. That's why you must have more and more enlightened beings, more and more kind-hearted, generous, and beautiful uh, living beings to arise the appropriate, good, wholesome consciousness. And these are very useful. Mm. Okay, then the second way is to think, uh, sorry, to contemplate the danger of holding on to all these wrong thought, wrong speech and wrong action, because they are evil roots, root of all evil, make you evil. So if you allow anger, hatred and greed and delusion to be part of your mental consciousness, what will happen to you? These are evil root. It will make you evil. So the consequence of it is it will lead to karmic negativity, karmic downfall. Is that what you want? If that is not what you want, then determine to abandon it. So whenever the evil roots are there, you must abandon it. These two ways are still thought-based meditation. But they are important, skillful means that can help the cultivator to overcome the unwholesome thought training as taught by the Buddha to help the cultivator develop the wisdom needed to free the mind from such unwholesome thought. This is especially so for the third way. Eh? What is it? Skip one line. Oh, is it? Wait, I read again. Eh? It seems I skip one line. Eh? Okay, I read again the whole thing. These first two ways are still thought-based meditation, but they are important skillful means that can help the cultivator to overcome the unwholesome thought. We are the first two right effort. Oh, yeah. Whereas the third and fourth way are meditative training as taught by the Buddha to help the cultivator develop the wisdom needed to free the mind from such unwholesome thought. 
This is especially so for the third way. And third way is the best. This is the meditative way. And this one is the easiest. Yeah? The Buddha say, just silence your mind and don't do anything. That is what meditation is all about. Relax, maintain awareness. That is how you silence your mind. Maintain awareness means you aware, don't think. Thinking is no longer aware. When you start to think, you are no longer aware. Aware means before the thinking, before the knowing. So this part is very important. Eh? Then the mind will settle down on its own to return to its natural state of silence and still before the steering. Conditioned by one's self-delusion or wrong view. This understanding can lead to profound wisdom. And this is the meditative way. Eh? Relax, maintain awareness. Or silence your mind and don't do anything. Don't even try to know. Don't even try to arise the thought to meditate. Just relax, maintain awareness. And let the mind settle down and return to its original state before the stirring before the thinking, before the arising of thought. Can you be with the silent without thought? Try. Initially, I know it's very difficult where you think a lot. Why do you think a lot? Where you never train your mind. You are very heedless. When you lack the spiritual faculties, the mental hindrance will arise. And the mean, mental hindrance will make you heedless. Think a lot. That is what mental hindrance is all about. It hinders your mind from entering the meditative state of inner peace, inner calmness, and inner awareness. That's why you think a lot. Because you have been doing this heedless thinking without stop. <laughs> Every moment of sense experience when you see something, you react to it. That's how your thinking arises, like and dislike, pleasant and unpleasant, and you proliferate your thought. Then when you hear something, you do the same. Smell something, do the same. Taste something, do the same. Tactile feel, also you do the same. That's why human being very funny. Rain also complain, no rain also complain. Too cold also complain, too hot also complain. What is going on? Why can't you develop the understanding of the mind to be at peace with all situations? Have gratitude that the sun is there to provide you with the solar energy, the sunshine, to dry your clothes for the farmer yeah, to have their harvest and all those things. Then when there is rain, rejoice. Now we have enough water, enough water supply. Now it cools down the weather. Instead, always complain, complain and complain. Who complain? Selfish people who want things their way because you don't have the love, the compassion, the gratitude, the generosity. You cannot appreciate the good things of life. My teacher, who is very good, Jayantra, the Thai monk, he is very good. He liked to observe nature and he said, Nature is our best teacher. He learned so much from nature. He said, nature has great loving kindness, great compassion. At first, I couldn't figure out why he said that. No. But then he added, he said, nature just give, give and give. Nature never take. Human being very selfish, not the other so they want to take. Then he said, the air we breathe, come from where? Come from nature, isn't it? Did he charge you any money? No. The sunshine you get from nature, the resources of nature, the raw material that we build our house, construct our highway, hospital, buildings. How we convert the resources of nature for the comfort of mankind. That is my profession as a civil engineer. We convert the resources of nature for the comfort of mankind. But what did mankind give back to nature? All the pollution, all the shit, huh? all the terrible thing. Huh? So when you look 
at nature from this point of view you realize nature has great loving kindness and compassion the air we breathe the water we drink the resources that we receive they all come from nature and nature never charge but human being very selfish they monopolize the concession then they charge but everything come from nature then if you really look at how nature teaches he look at a tree he say this tree has great loving kindness they are willing to endure the sunlight and give the shade down there for human being and what did the human being do they chop the tree they do all the funny business underneath the tree so you look at the selfishness of human being and the great loving kindness of nature then nature has this beautiful what they call uh, balance yeah. when you really understand nature man and nature must harmonize then you can actually benefit a lot from nature nature has its own way of turning things around nature actually heal very fast yeah. when you don't do anything to harm and pollute nature nature heal that's the reason why you go to uh, when you go for a holiday or tour or whatever you go to somewhere where people don't go or, or seldom go like new zealand they are more sheep than human being when i was there i can feel the nature there it was so pristine so pure so beautiful so clear the energy is so good even the food i take i consume is so different the consciousness is so clean so pure less of those human pollution where most of the thinking are from the sheep and the sheep are very uh, straightforward animals <laughs> no cunningness he will bring a lot of cunningness a lot of jealousy a lot of hatred a lot of negative thought negative tendency uh, emotion and all those things so when you travel you can feel that you can really really enjoy their what they call nature's like uh, uh, nature's uh, contribution towards a very cozy and nice environment for human being to actually live then the air we breathe the oxygen that we take in they are so pristine so fresh so beautiful so when you can sense all this and feel all this then you have a lot of gratitude to a stage you have a lot of joy that you can never do thing in a negative manner uh, so all this is part and parcel of the teaching and the understanding eh? so now we move on to number four on oh, number three i didn't read the last line eh? this understanding can lead to profound wisdom uh, so meditation is very simple relax maintain awareness let your mind settle down and return to its original state before the thinking start before the emotion the stirring the reaction start uh, realize that true mind that silent mind that awareness nature within then you will become beautiful then you can meditate then number four Oh, sorry. There's another sentence before number four. Just like J. Krishnamurti's famous quote, "The very flowering of thought, or the very flowering of the unwholesome thought, like anger, fear, etc., is the very ending of that thought." So this one I have gone through. Huh? When the Buddha, via his fourth way, trained the cultivator to develop true understanding and wisdom. we are tracing the origination factor and retrospectively reverse it we are understanding to liberate the mind and this is very important this fourth way is very important you have to trace the origination factor yeah? means how anger arises how emotion arises how selfishness arises how fear arises all this trace the origination factor mm. 
The origination of this unwholesome thought is always via one of our sense door consciousness, especially the seeing, hearing, and the thought consciousness sense door. When we understand the cause behind the stirring of the mind, then we should contemplate. Oh, again, mistake. Huh? Yeah. Uh, then we should contemplate huh? the three turnings of the Four Noble Truth, uh, especially the second turning, until the wisdom is very stable and clear, so that the next time when we confront similar situation, when we see something, hear something, or think of something, we will not be deluded by them anymore. And we can have the wisdom to deal with the situation. The ability to silence the mind and to accept the reality of the moment without any reaction or judgment is wisdom. Then to be able to use this clarity of awareness or heedfulness to investigate the truth and characteristics of all phenomena in our daily life is true meditation. The ability to accept the reality of all sensation and feeling is also wisdom. The mind can only understand what is going on. We are just a silent inner awareness to observe the truth and the reality of the moment without any suppression or control of any emotion. That is just allowing it to flower or let things be to develop the wisdom that comes with it. Using the mind sweeping method combined with metta to decondition your heedless thinking so that your mind can be trained to be in a state of relaxed, silent inner awareness, to be heedful to meditate is very important. This heedfulness will be able to investigate clearly how the tactile consciousness comes to be. You just silent your mind to be aware, to investigate the truth and the reality within the moment and you will understand how they arise and pass away with every moment of arising of the tactile consciousness. You can then be aware of the pulling sensation to understand clearly how the form and mind function. There is always a knowing element which can be aware of the pulling sensation phenomena that has a reason. The awareness of my moment is always moment to moment has no reality at all because they are all conditioned arising, mental phenomena or consciousness only. But due to your self-delusion, you grasp and cling onto them, hence conditioning your suffering via your wrong view. This understanding is very important to enable one to break free from the concept of self and self-delusion. Okay, we almost finished huh? the last one. Uh, uh, is it the last one already? Eh? Oh, still one more page. Oh, we stop here. Eh? 我想现在有, uh, okay, uh, because uh, lately, uh, Bama Suri invite me to his house ah, uh, yes, dinner yeah. during the weekend. Uh, yeah, then yeah, after yeah. dinner, we have to Dharma, then we have to do uh, meditation. Ah, so, so uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah. straight 就整个很像open out 就他,但就在那一邊就是很strong的,他就是在那邊啊,pressing。你要relax 
接下来的整两次的 meditation 术，它就变成越来越呃比较没有这么样的 hard 的那种 pressing 了，在那一边。你要 relax， 你不 relax 啊、uh, ，the thing will build up one， the 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 thing will become like 你感觉到好像 pressing， because 你不够 relax 啊，你要 relax， 嗯、mm. ， then 给它 soothing， either resolve or whatever， don't do anything， just relax into it， that's why whatever arise， relax into it， don't try to know， 我都不要知道，啊，嗯， just do that， 嗯、uh,。Because、mm. this energy, the movement, ah,、uh, can be in many forms. On then sometimes it comes to itself. When it comes to itself, it will come. Then you have to find out.、Mm. You, have to find out. you have to understand. But when it happens, don't try to know. Just let it be. Let the whole thing finish.、Mm. What you have to remember is always、mm. don't go back to the thought. Always remember silence,、mm. relax, and let the nature do. Even to locate down that gateway or whatever, something else supposed to happen.、Mm. Uh, if you relax,、mm. then something else can happen. Uh. Uh, then,、mm. like what、mm. Po Cheng went through, things can just happen.、Uh, so you you have to remember to relax, and in future when you do all this meditation. You just relax and maintain awareness. Then you feel that the sitting is comfortable. Okay, then you continue to sit. Otherwise, you can find out to lying down. Ah,、uh, sometimes lying down can help you understand more and resolve your problem. Because sometimes sitting, I realize is not so conducive for our awareness base. Meditation, sitting has its、uh, benefits and all those things, but because of the way we cross our leg, and the way the bodily posture is, it is not a fully relaxed state. Means your form and mind, your body is not fully relaxed. So when it's not fully relaxed, a lot of the energy movement cannot develop. Cannot develop.、Uh, in the ancient, the people tend to sit is because if you look around during that time, they don't have chair like us. When I was young, I remember in the fifties,、uh, I was born in the early fifties. Then later on, as I grew up, even the early sixties, our house hardly have chair. <laughs> We most of us sit on the floor. Only dinner time, we 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 gather all the whatever chair we have.、Uh, my dad is a Chinese and say there's a long bench. We use the long bench and sit and just have our dinner. Then after that, we put it back.、Uh, the house hardly have not that many chairs. Remember, maybe we got four or five chairs only.、Uh, But we normally use the long bench. And sometimes we take our food and sit on the floor and eat. Uh, or we just put it on something, then we just eat.、Mm. So you will be more relaxed if you are in the lying down posture. You can find out.、Yeah. It's up to you. But key thing is relax, uh, relax. Uh, uh, I, 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 I,
they were talking at the back, you know. Hey, you don't play a fool with Brother Theo. You can sit there for three hours without moving, you know, in that close legged posture. You know, that time I was still young. Then I know how to relax. Then I know how to allow the chi to flow. But ever since I started developing the lying down posture, then I realized that posture is so easy, so much more conducive. That's why I start to do that. I start to do that. Then sometimes when I teach meditation, I need to see because certain people are alien to that lying down uh, posture. Uh, especially last time, I remember Brother Chia when he came for the retreat. He had never seen people are lying down. And the worst is there are some snoring here and there. He said, what type of meditation is this? Until later on, he himself uh, snore. Then only he realized, uh, oh, no wonder. Actually, when he snore, there was awareness. One sound, he aware. And then he started to understand there is meditation. Uh, so, like I said, lie down. The danger is you fall asleep. You're too comfortable. Eh? Relax, you should sleep, isn't it? Yeah. After you relax, you will fall asleep. Yeah, it's very conducive for sleeping. So meditation is to maintain awareness. So that is the skill. So relax, maintain awareness. That's what meditation is. Then if it's really tired, want to sleep, sleep. Uh, otherwise, maintain awareness. Then when it snore, for the first sound come out, before it complete the snoring, you're already aware because you maintain awareness. So when it snore means the mind is going into the subconscious and the unconscious, it's going to rest, going to sleep, so that the nature's uh, life force from our karmic nature they can work their way through the organs. Uh, so even the, uh, I think, the Chinese medicine, uh, they, they have this uh, teaching where they can tell you the qi flow. Uh, there's like a clock, you know, uh, our nature's qi, uh, like a clock. They move around your organ. Uh, so what time, what time they are at which organ also. That is to actually heal you. Because when you don't have any thought process to interfere with that type of nature's chi, which is your life force energy, it will heal you. That's why when you have deep sleep, you feel like you, you have recuperated very fresh. But when you don't have deep sleep, means what? The, the sankara, the subconscious release keep on arising. Means you don't have proper deep sleep. So that one interfere. That's why you must be in a state of very relaxed state. Mm. So never mind, whether sitting or lying down is up to you. You have to find out on your own. Always remember, relax into it. Mm. More important is the understanding part. Mm. Whether what happened, what happened, not important. Uh, when it happens, just relax into it and let the nature do its work. Uh, then many other things will happen. Then when it happens, it can give rise to wisdom and understanding. Then I can guide you. Sometimes you yourself also will know, will understand. Mm. Okay? Yeah, so? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sadhu. Mm, sadhu. Uh, yeah. Hi, you. Uh, Brother,有起，有起是好。我morning五点半就起来，呃，把我想在呃continue to but sometimes it's a conditioned thinking. Sometimes it's your conditioned thinking that actually arise that thought. So you have to find out if it's really that nature wants you to sit, then you will know, then you just sit. Then you will find out, you will understand. Because sometimes I 
shared with you before, sometimes for no reason uh, during the day, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the nature will make you like go and meditate. Uh, so if you don't take the hint or the clue, it, it will like make you very sleepy one. So sometimes I, I, I realize if the awareness is still like that, then I knew something is happening. Means that nature wants me to meditate. That's why after that I echo and flow, I just lie down, relax, and I went into it. And then the meditation moved in. Because sometimes the nature will know it's time for you to relax away and go into the gateway. So during the early days when I was doing the gateway meditation, it happened many times. Uh, but nowadays, no more. Nowadays, it has stabilized, become like normal again already. Uh, so you find out for yourself. Huh? So if it really want you to sit, if it's not a conditioned thinking, then sit. Then there is a reason why. Uh, then whatever happened, like I said, relax into it. Huh? Relax into it. When you say towards the morning before you wake up, there is something at the heart there. How do you know that it's asking you to sit? Did you try to relax into it and maintain awareness? See what will happen. Yeah. So? I No, when it moves, you no need to resist. Be with it. Understand uh. not? The awareness control mm. the movement. Mm. You don't to resist it. Understand mm. Let it be. That's why I ask you whether it's a condition, uh, thought, thinking, or that nature want you to do. If that nature want you to do is if it's not a condition thought, means you have not been like creating this type of thinking that you had to sit. Then it is the nature. Then you just sit. Uh, but most of the time, I. Believe is a conditioned thought when you describe it that way because that movement that come uh, you're supposed to relax into it, accord and flow, then flow with it. Then see what happens. Uh, when you flow with it, uh, it's very different. One. Uh, when you don't resist it, uh, you just relax and let it flow. Then that movement like slow down. Then that nature and that movement as one. Uh, then after that it will transform again uh, you you find out more eh? you find out more don't be too eager to know that one is a very important reminder okay. uh, when you meditate just let it be let it happen because the main intent of all this meditative movement and uh, uh, development is to develop the wisdom and the understanding. So whatever happened, there are causes and conditions behind. So when you echo and flow, you does not interfere, relax, maintain awareness, then you will develop. That nature will just move and create all the necessary transformation in you. Uh, then later on, when the gateway open up, is different again. There's a different movement again. Like Poching's case, the thing like a tunnel open up suddenly. Uh, but to open up, you need to be very stable, silent, completely relaxed, and don't do anything. Then the condition arise, then only it starts to open up. Uh, it, it cannot be a will or intention or a mind that is there. It cannot. When there is a mind, it doesn't happen. Uh, so, just let things be and let it happen. Okay? Mm, okay, yeah. Uh, sadu. Eh? Mm. Sadu, sadu. Ah. Mm.